My name is Melissa Hathaway, and I have the, the great honor to be here with my distinguished colleagues to help uh, listen to the wrap-up. To my left is uh, John Stewart, uh, the Chief Security Officer from Cisco. Uh, to my right is uh, Dr. Kamlesh uh, Bajaj, the Chief Executive Officer of Data Security Council of India. And then to his right is <clears throat> Dr. Carl Rauscher, the Chief Technology Officer here at the East-West Institute. We're going to be your commentators as we listen to the summary of all of the work that has been done over the last two days and certainly over the last year um, and the different uh, breakthrough groups. We're going to hear from um, uh, different uh, 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 spokespeople. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Pete Cornell, who is the spokesperson for the Operational Risk Management Emergency Management section. He will be followed by Ramses Martinez, uh, who will be speaking on measures uh, of effectiveness, trust building, and confidence building, followed by Jib Goodwin, <clears throat> Godwin, who's going to be talking to uh, rules of the road, rules of engagement. Uh, they're all going to call on other spokespeople from their groups, uh, as there was more than 20 um, working groups associated with the different breakthrough groups. But these uh, gentlemen will be our primary uh, spokespersons for the groups. And I would like to invite <clears throat> Pete Cornell to the podium to uh, begin uh, the brief out of his breakthrough group. Thank you so much. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak before this body. Um, I'm asked to facilitate the section here on the uh, operational uh, preparedness, um, two areas, uh, priority communications and the uh, Roguchi study. And uh, I've been asked to uh, summarize both of these, I think, have very direct impact on the uh, ability of the providers to serve customers and in fact then serve the clients and customers within those uh, entities. So I think that I have uh, James Bodner, and I can't see from here, so um, somewhere in the front here to speak to IPC, or uh, Stu Goldman. I can't see a thing up here with the lights. Yeah, they were supposed to be down front here with uh, well, we could get the microphones to them quickly. So if you would, please, uh, Stu, take about um, probably about five or six minutes to just summarize your progress, your key points, uh, anything that you thought that was new to the table and a breakthrough achievement, and then if you could summarize with just maybe one or two key uh, strategic uh, initiatives going forward, where we are. And this is on IPC? Please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we spent uh, two sessions working on the... Um, international priority communications, which as you probably are aware is a uh, carryover from the work that we did last year in Dallas. So this group um, had a good strong starting point rather than just coming together and uh, with new material. Uh, we looked at the um, recommendations from Dallas of which there were four and uh, we looked at a number of the next steps that uh, had been defined a year ago. The recommendations remained valid uh, for this group, and the majority of the next steps also remained valid in going forward and trying to uh, promote the international priority communication, get a working group going over the next 12 months so that we will have a correspondence group working on the issue and not just waiting until we get to Dali to, um, to address the topic again. Uh, by and large, we agreed with the conclusions from last year, the first conclusion being that international priority communication is valuable to address the needs during a communication crisis, uh, whether it be uh, natural, man-made, whatever, that most crises do benefit from having support across international boundaries. We agreed that by and large the protocols that are available from the standards bodies are sufficient for doing the uh, communication, but where the lack is is on the implementation and the deployment. 
and we committed as a group to work on the implementation and deployment to see to it that it starts to move and that we would start coming together as uh, bilateral agreements and multilateral agreements. Does that pretty much cover it for you, Pete? I think it does. Is there any area of assistance that you think that the group needs? Any more resources they need to call on? Yeah. We need lots of resources. The more resources we have, the more facilities we have, obviously the uh, greater uh, progress we can make. We need commitments from governments. We need commitments from the equipment manufacturers, from the operators, and really a, an emphasis from the decision makers that this is something that is valuable and is needed and needs to be deployed now because we don't know when the next crisis is going to occur. But I can't give you anything more specific other than we need lots of participation okay. across the sectors. Well, thank you. Thank you for a concise summary. Um, I'll now then turn to Mick, who had two, he's speaking for two uh, sessions now. Can we get the microphone to Mick Green here, second row? Um, Raguchi, which was a uh, uh, IEEE sponsored study, uh, Carl was instrumental in its creation and generation out of a Dubai effort, and that uh, was partnered into the East West Institute. Uh, it has to do with undersea cables. So, two of our areas in focus were this of recommendations out of that report, and I'll ask Mick Green to give us kind of the highlights and what we see as next steps. Okay, Thank, thanks very much, Pete. In, in terms of the recommendations, the, f the first recommendation uh, was a recommendation two which is really for timely repairs of cables um, uh, following uh, failure. Um, in terms of the, the, the industry, the industry has a capability of mobilizing cable ships within 12 to 24 hours. Um, but in many countries, there are permissions, permits that are required before a repair can take place. Um, historically, this duration has been up to six months uh, the, the permissions can include visas for uh, ship's crew, it can include customs um, and general sort of, uh, sort of military, military uh, clearances. So, so given that the actual repair operation could be completed in around sort of five days once the ship is on site, there is a massive uh, delay uh, potentially in advance of the repair operation. Um, there's been a lot of progress uh, in terms of addressing these delays by uh, sort of looking to undertake as much pre-approval as possible. Um, the duration now is down to sort of one to two months from six months. Um, our goal ultimately is to get down to around five days, which means by the time the cable ship would be arrived on site to the repair, that the permits would be um, in place. One of the things we was uh, looking at in, in the group is to actually start to sort of call upon the support of the finance sector because um, uh, there's, a, there's sort of key impact on the finance sector. Um, and certainly in the breakout group, there was a sort of lack of awareness, in, in fact, in terms of uh, the sort of problems that the, the industry is uh, facing from permits. Um, linked into that, in terms of sort of some next steps, we recognized um, a sort of benefit of undertaking a, an independent study that uh, sort of focused on globally where the choke points are and the sort of coastal states around those choke points and look at that study to understand the, um, the permit process and the duration of those permits um, and to compare with what is the best in class, which is in fact uh, no uh, permits but just a 24-hour uh, notification. Um, so look, International Cable Protection Committee, which sort of moves a little bit on to the next recommendation, has undertaken quite a few sort of uh, um, workshops with different governments um, to sort of brief on the problem, and that's what, what started to sort of trigger the, the improvements. The, the final thing around that we've sort of uh, raised and uh, we certainly need to keep uh, awareness on is what we've called jurisdictional creep. That is, uh, Countries where at this point in time there are no permit processes gradually looking to include permit processes both within their territorial waters uh, and in fact um, you know, potentially outside of their territorial waters. So you know, we have a problem at the moment that we're addressing. Um, we're looking to resolve that one but we've also got to be aware of 
the sort of potential increase in the problem with other countries um, following what is bad practice. Did you want to move on to the second one? Second one, yeah. please, yes. The second one, recommendation five, was um, it was sort of calling upon the uh, a sort of gov governance framework for uh, global un undersea cable infrastructure to provide optimum support for its resilience uh, through cross-sector coordination and effectively support stakeholder interests. Um, what we did within that uh, group, there's, there's a um, industry fora called the International Cable Protection Committee. And uh, as that committee um, sort of undertook following the Raguchi study to undertake a review of its uh, charter. And uh, as a result of that review, um, ICPC became a, um, uh, a sort of wider cr uh, sort of a sector representation. It used to be focused on just owners and operators of submarine cables. Um, the, the membership increased to include ship operators, uh, survey companies, um, cable, cable system suppliers, and we also introduced a, uh, a category called a government category because uh, many of the um, sort of benefits that the submarine cable industry enjoys through the, uh, the UN, well, effectively the law of the sea, uh, but it's coastal states that can actually enforce the law of the sea, not owners or operators of submarine cables. So by bringing governments in as a partnership to improve the protection. Um, so, in terms of the measures for this recommendation, one was whether or not um, it was to undertake a review of the um, charter, and we concluded that review had been undertaken and that particular measure of success had been um, cleared. The second element was to involve the financial sector within this uh, new government structure. Uh, what, what the ICPC have, have done is to actually recognize the, um, the capability for affiliations of finance sector organizations with, um, with ICPC. Um, there isn't a uh, financial sector organization yet affiliated, but as a, a next step that was agreed upon, actions taken away for the, the FSSCC, which is the Financial Services Sector Coordination um, Committee, to uh, consider um, affiliating with uh, ICPC. So we consider that one is, the capability is certainly there, but uh, the um, affiliation is not, so we're, we're close to completion there. And finally, um, was for the, the industry to establish a sort of, a sort of single voice. And uh, what we concluded in the, uh, the session was that the, the ICPC was that de facto voice of the submarine cable industry. So we, we sort of summarize that we're around about the uh, sort of 80% complete. In terms of support going forward, a lot of the progress that the ICPC has made is through um, workshops uh, with government. The focus of these workshops have been in the Asia-Pac region. That's been triggered by the sort of significant events that have occurred in the Asia-Pac region in the past, the, sort of the earthquakes off of Taiwan in particular. And those workshops have been um, very constructive. They've involved in many cases around about sort of 17, 18 governments of, on each occasion. But the reason we've been able to obtain those uh, that sort of level of representation is because of sponsorship from the uh, Center for International Law in Singapore. So we're very Asia-Pac focused in terms of our awareness with governments. And we're looking to increase and that awareness through Europe and, uh, and of course, the US as well. Uh, with Americas, so there's a potential gap there in terms of sponsorship. All right, thank you. Um, I'm, uh, we're going to now go through um, and sort of like American Idol or some other American television show that you all can laugh at. Uh, we're going to give sort of our uh, summary of things. And uh, since Carl um, managed a lot of this process and so was so intimate with the working groups over the last uh, year in this process, he's going to uh, really kind of give the scorecard and um, of uh, how things are going and his recommendations for going forward. And then Kamlash and uh, John and I are going to uh, have a broader discussion of what we heard. So with that, Carl. Thank you, Melissa. 
Um, well, the Institute has, has been branded with a tagline of being a think and do tank. And that's a hard uh, reputation to maintain. I mean, these are all, are, are all very difficult issues, and just to, to contribute in a thinking way is, is a significant challenge. And yet what you've just heard today is that there's a lot of doing going on. If you remember the one chart I showed, I told you in Dallas we pretty much were in the brainstorming, that yellow mode, and we have things actually in the implementation and the, in, in the uh, institutionalization uh, level. And the last the description we just heard of was from the, the vice chair of the ICPC taking on and institutionalizing and implementing these recommendations. So this is tremendously encouraging. Within 12 months we've had very difficult problems uh, solved with uh, – actionable recommendations are being implemented. And what happened here at the summit was that there was rigorous review. I mean, I was able to stop by and visit each of the breakthrough groups, and there was very rigorous discussion with the financial sector. And the fact that in that environment, the breakthrough groups this week, you're able to confirm that you have established new governance for the, uh, the uh, global undersea communications cable industry, um, and also um, able to produce uh, best practices for guidance for governments, governments for how to address this very critical issue of providing more timely repair. Abs absolutely um, um, noteworthy to recognize the, the, the progress made and the doing that's going on. On the first topic of international party communications, um, this is, is so critical. In 9-11 in our country, 95 percent of the calls um, did not go through on 9-11. Those who had authorization, this kind of capability, they went through. Even though we've had a standard for 10 years, it's not been implemented. The, the, perhaps the, one of the most significant things I've heard took place in a breakthrough group was that when Matt Bross from Huawei, uh, you know, made a statement that he's willing to lead within his company an exploration of implementing this kind of capability proactively in every uh, system. And if we'd have about a half a dozen suppliers do that proactively, um, we basically have the capability existing software, you know, low-cost software throughout the world so that through, during any kind of congestion, governments would be able to make sure that their authorized users could communicate. This would save lives and save significant property every year at the rate we see catastrophes in this world. So very significant work in these breakthrough groups, and I commend um, all of you for their contributions to these. And, and thanks, Matt, for the, for the leadership there. Thank you. How much? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Melissa. I think in priority communications, uh, the two important things uh, which have come out are that the protocols are actually available. It is the implementation and deployment uh, which has been a challenge. And uh, the idea of uh, getting commitment of uh, governments, equipment manufacturers, suppliers, and so on, is something which is very, very critical. What is it that will actually motivate them to do so? Is it merely the creation of laws and regulations which will make it happen? Or there are other mot motivational factors? So this is something which has to be seen. Uh, in the case of Roguchi, uh, the two important recommendations that uh, the time has to be brought down for our repairs from six months uh, down to probably a week now is something which is a big challenge, although it is, something, it is, uh, it is clearly required. But uh, the issues of uh, coastal states uh, and uh, the role of the countries, but uh, one has to see that the protection or uh, security of the country is involved and the ships getting prior approval, uh, even for the people who are there, uh, that is uh, prior approval of the persons on the ships on board, uh, it can have challenges uh, for the governments, whether prior approval in this manner can be given, probably to a ship, but uh, for all the people. Uh, this, I think, has to be studied more in detail. So if any countries have implemented best practices in this, this should be identified. What are the processes uh, that they undertake? Uh, that should be brought to the fore and uh, made it available in the workshops uh, that you have been conducting for creating awareness of governments. But uh, another important recommendation of institutionalization, as uh, Carl just mentioned, in the governance structure is a, is a very, very important step and a step forward. Thank you, Kamash. John. So Pete, James, Mick, thank you, first of all, for being extremely eloquent in summarizing what I know is a considerable amount of work. Uh, and it was, it was educational in its own right just to hear your readouts uh, throughout the uh, throughout the tracks uh, I'm going to talk to two things uh, actually three total that uh, I thought were particularly interesting and then James I've actually got a clarifying question for you if you wouldn't mind um, so in particular uh, with the the work on international priority communications I found it first of all very encouraging that the Dallas recommendations 
uh, were revalidated versus uh, new recommendations having to be recreated. That means consistently for two different working sessions, the track is essentially on, uh, on, uh, on the right track. The second thing I found uh, particularly encouraging was that you were validating it's not a technological issue anymore. It's not a matter of the, the telco equipment providers doing anything per se, uh, given the IT, uh, ITF uh, standards and protocols already being sufficient. Rather, you had an implementation and deployment governance uh, suggestion that um, needed to make it consistent globally. The, um, the, the clarifying question I had for you, James, was it, when you talked about the fact that you wanted to make sure that it wasn't just in Delhi the next time that the, the working group essentially was together or reformed, uh, you discussed having over the next 12 months to 18 months uh, some work in progress. Is there or are you personally stepping up to the leadership of it? Was there a gap still there um, such that essentially someone said in, in American parlance you're going to be doubling down? What we agreed to unanimously in the room covering both sessions is that everybody in attendance signed their name and their email and agreed to be part of a, um, work, a virtual working group on the topic so that we will immediately following this conference send out our notes to the whole group so we are back to the same level of information and then we will work on following the uh, half dozen next steps to start to make some progress. One of the steps uh, included developing scenarios to show the value of this. The hypothetical cases, here's a scenario, and if you had this in place, this is what would be, the, how the service would work and what lives would be saved in, in property and so on. And by developing the scenarios on the working group, we hope to be able to encourage <laughs> the people that are in power to make the, uh, the service a reality, Great. to get the governments to, to mandate that they have it and to, as you heard, uh, some of the equipment manufacturers may be discussing the implementations and so on. And we just need to, to, to work on it as a group. Okay. Great. Thanks, James. That, that was what I wanted to know about. And I appreciate all the, the members continuing over the next 12 months to, to work that issue. Um, with regards to just uh, mixed comments, uh, final, final two points. Uh, I found it particularly encouraging that an effective process that could be within 24 hours, no permits required, was going to be considered the benchmark. Uh, almost a goal, if you will, um, and that to determine precisely how it is that that's working, to then extend it out to where today, even though it's been progress from six months to one to two, um, you're trying to essentially say best in class and, if, you know, what's the vehicle by which that be consistent globally. And then the second piece with IC, uh, ICPC, and I've seen this track work, uh, getting the governments directly involved as a sub-track, essentially bringing them together, such that the, the operators themselves that are trying to do the repairs are intersecting with the policymakers that are the ones that can be the efficiency drivers. So I, I appreciated those two points. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. I think what struck me is that um, through the last uh, the dialogue and the different working groups, uh, we continue to underscore the dependence and cross-sector dependence on telecommunications and undersea cables. And in the event of a crisis, whether it be an earthquake um, or some other natural disaster or man-made disaster by pulling the cable lines, it underscores the need for the ability to quickly restore and, um, and enable the priority communications. So um, as John said and, and the, the team, I, I, my quote would be is mind the gap. As, and as you mind the gap of six months to five days to 24 hours, how are we gonna measure our progress in, in closing the gap in those priority communications and res restoration of the undersea cables? I also noted the fact that there is a good cross dialogue on the necessity of the, the telecommunications and the undersea cables don't just affect the financial services, perhaps financial services affects the most around the world given its dependence and our global economy. And I think that as we look at that, <clears throat> the partnership between the ICPC and the FSS or the financial services sector coordination uh, committee are perhaps the best way to garner the support and get the involvement of a broad-based industry along with the governments. As Kamlesh said, 
how do you actually compel everybody to work uh, together to get to the suppliers, the equipment manufacturers, and to close that gap? And I think that this is where um, perhaps um, a, a, a thoughtful conversation needs to occur between the governments and industry because the government may naturally turn toward regulation, whereas industry may prefer the market incentives of either tax breaks and or research and or stockpiling. And I think that that would be perhaps the next most important thing that these two groups can work together um, to look at what are the appropriate market incentives to close that gap to be able to get to um, a more assured telecommunications infrastructure. At this time, I would like uh, to invite um, Ramses Martinez to discuss the trust building, the confidence uh, measures, and the overall measures of effectiveness uh, that were addressed in three or four different subpanels. Thank you, Martinez. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you for the opportunity to um, speak at this venue. It's, uh, it's really a privilege. So as I was um, talking to a few people and I had uh, not a whole lot of time to prepare for this today, I, I was asking a colleague about trust and what she thought was kind of like the biggest problem in security with trust. And she gave me a very interesting answer. She said, um, the biggest problem with trust is explaining it to lawyers, what it means. Take that for whatever it's worth. But, uh, so I, I thought that was interesting. But I think when it comes to cybersecurity, a lot of times we uh, tend to focus uh, very heavily on the technical aspect of things. Uh, a lot of us are trained uh, you know, in, in, in the technical discipline, so it's easy, it's almost comfortable to go down that path. It's also you know, comfortable for a lot of us to go down the policy path as well. And we, we focus on these areas, we come up with great solutions, it's, you know, we, we have the tools, we have the means to do things, but a lot of times things don't happen the way we expect them to, and very often these things don't happen the way we expect them to because something fundamental is missing, and that is trust. Um, I, I looked up the definition of trust because I, I, there are various, uh, but I wanted to put it out here to put in the context of our conversation here. And uh, one of the online dictionaries is defined it as firm reliance on the integrity, ability, or character of a person or thing. Think about that, how important that is when we're dealing with cybersecurity issues. We have multiple parties in this room all working uh, toward, in which case is single goals, but without trust, these things will not be achieved. So a lot of the programs that we have here are geared towards you know, achieving these solutions, but we need that trust, and that is important. And we need it at multiple levels. We need it at a micro level between institutions, between the individuals working on the projects, but most importantly, for solutions to really be achieved we need that trust at a very high level, at the nation level, you know, between large institutions. Without that, it, you know, things just won't happen. So I want to talk a little bit now that kind of lay out the scenario about the findings of our group. I was involved uh, in the measuring of the cybersecurity problems. And we went into this um, work session yesterday with four questions. One was, what data should we be capturing? Second one was, what type of model should we be using to analyze this data? The third one was, what type of organization should be used to disseminate this data? And then the fourth one, which we ended up combining with a fifth one, was basically, what should this organization look like, the funding, what should the structure of it be? And we had some very interesting input during the session. In terms of the data itself, we talked about technical data, obviously. We needed something actionable. We needed things, you know, from packet captures to IP addresses, things that every recipient of this data could take and then make actionable. At the end of the day, you need something to be able to, you know, implement a solution, and it needs to be actionable. But we also started expanding from that, and we looked at things, you know, like the cost of a breach financial cost, uh, damage to the brand. We started then expanding from there and looking at how these things are influenced by regulation, how they're influenced by some of the incentives that companies may or may not have to report a breach and came up with a, a really interesting series of even, uh, we got into the point where we had incentives 
for companies and institutions to be able to disclose a breach. From there, we moved on to the model, which we all pretty much agreed that should be risk-based. Uh, after all, security is all about managing risk. Um, we, we, we then went into a risk scale, so we arbitrarily came up with a 1 to 10. Of course, this could be changed uh, very easily. We didn't think it was practical or even necessary to reinvent the wheel here, so we could very easily build on some of the models that exist, things like actuarial models, use them as a foundation in the context of the web, its distributed nature, uh, it's, you know, non, you know, specific to one geography nature and, you know, expand from there and come up with a model that's truly adaptable uh, and feasible to use in a global environment such as the Internet. When we got into the organization, we had uh, a lot of strong opinions. Uh, there were um, things like models based on uh, sort of a public uh, health model like the uh, World Health Organization type model, essentially looking at the web as an ecosystem, um, thinking uh, that essentially if one player is affected in this environment, all players are affected, so it, it basically everybody benefits from the sharing of data and having this data and, you know, have integrity all throughout the system. We looked at building again on existing groups, uh, using what was there, looking at where efficiencies could be gained and then expanding from there as well. It was probably in the fourth question that things got really interesting because that's where I personally felt in the table that I was at that we were kind of going back to, you know, the old brick and mortar world and we were somehow ignoring the distributed nature uh, of, of the Internet. We almost fell back to this, let's build a very hierarchical, uh, very structured institution. And while there were recommendations in that area, I think one of the most interesting ones that we had was a recommendation for a very open, um, non-structured you know, model, meaning something where uh, an application or a, uh, you know, something uh, on, on the web, an entity that would allow the submission of data, multiple languages, multiple geographies, would aggregate this data, would be able to take this data then and essentially looking at the events as they're reported around the world, you know, determine the severity based on probably some artificial type intelligence algorithms and come up with, you know, a, 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 you know put the threat into context for different players and what it meant to them. And the idea was that this would not be regulated by any one country, any one institution. It would be a self-policing mechanism. And, and I think that's where the key to this uh, method that was proposed really was, you know, important. It, it was a fact that there was no one regulating it. You know, sure, there could be misinformation, but at the end of the day, very quickly, because it was exposed to everyone, uh, the information would be self-corrected. So that was probably the most interesting finding that we had out of uh, our, our group. What I would like to do is I would like to go through some of the other areas and talk about trust and have my colleagues come up and, and give their input on the results of their groups. I'd like to start with uh, Ms. Su Yuan from China, who's here with us. And she can give us her perspective on the spam work. I sit in the back of the conference room, and uh, I'm Yuan Xu from the Internet Society of China. Over a year early, the East West Institute and uh, I see our Internet Society of China convert a uh, convert a team of China and the U.S. expert uh, for the bilateral. A dialogue on cybersecurity issue. Uh, our first topic is about spam. Uh, during the discussion, we uh, more than 30 experts from the both country joined the discussion, and uh, we hosted about 15 meetings for the communication, including the face-to-face -face meeting and uh, uh, conference calls. 
Uh, after the discussion, we succeeded in achieving the three goals. Uh, decided at the beginning of the dialogue. The first is open a genuine uh, dialogue. The second is uh, develop the deeper understanding. And uh, at last, we get agreement on the matters to reduce spam. Uh, at last, we released a report before the submit. It named is uh, building uh, is fighting spam to build trust. I think that is the topic of the trust. Uh, so uh, in this report, we submit uh, two recommendations and uh, 46 backright best practice for how to reduce spam. I think uh, I I will thank you for EWIs for is effort to promote the dialogue for this uh, bilateral dialogue. And uh, we hope uh, we can continue to cooperation the dialogue and uh, together report implementment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ron. And I'd like to follow uh, up with Jason Savick from uh, the U.S. side of the house in this project and give us his perspective. Thank you. Check two. Hello? Hold on one sec. Okay. I'm going to actually show my bosses that I was here. <laughs> so that'd be cool. Thanks very much. <clears throat> It'll be even more fun tonight. Um, following up at what our uh, Chinese counterparts had also said this was actually been fantastic. We came out with the fighting spam to build trust over the past year. Uh, you said about 15 meetings. It did feel more like 45, um, but they were all excellent. Uh, finding out what our colleagues were going through overseas, uh, what other ISPs were also going through too, and how each of us can help each other uh, was extremely important. Uh, they have the same challenges that, that we do as an ISP. Um, the biggest thing that came out of our first session was that there is a need to keep the communication going. Uh, whether that is a large organization overseeing the world, um, multiple organizations at country level, uh, all the way down to regular, you know, just the ISP level, is that the communication needs to keep flowing. Most of us are communications companies. We do need to actually communicate. Uh, really probably the best thing that we've got out of our session so far. Um, we know that the spammers and the hackers talk to each other all the time. They help each other to get their payloads through your mail servers and ours. And we want to continue that to be able to stop it, make it a better experience not only for uh, the customers, but also keeping costs down for the ISPs. Um, so we did get the report, 46 recommendations. Um, going into somewhere and actually putting out 46 recommendations, very tough. Uh, but our first thing that we did start, at least focus in ours, was keep the communication going, find an organization that can help to bring everyone together. Um, and thanks to the East-West Institute for bringing us together, because realistically we didn't know how to start the dialogue. And uh, starting it together to build this was uh, just the first step. It definitely will continue. I think we're a little short on time, so I'd like to follow up with our colleague, Mark Adams, uh, on the ICT report. There he is. Thank you. So, all right. So uh, we, we had the uh, supply chain breakout, so uh, supply chain integrity. So the fundamental question is, how do you validate the trustworthiness of your products and solutions when Hardware or software is manufactured globally using uh, different methodologies and uh, has varying supply chains, right? So fundamentally, you know, the question we're trying to answer is, is how, do we, how do we improve that trustworthiness? Uh, one of the findings uh, right off the bat is this is truly a global issue, right? That, that cannot really be solved holistically at a national level uh, because these products and solutions are manufactured with, uh, you know, with different countries involved. Uh, and that it also would require uh, government and industry to collaborate and work together. It's not something that uh, we believe can be solved without, without that occurring. 
Um, it's also a life cycle issue, so we could put the best uh, process for validation and certification out in the world, uh, but as soon as you deploy a product or solution, it is dynamic and it's changing daily. So how do you, you know, if you're changing one component, that, that could uh, compromise the entire uh, trustworthiness of your supply chain. So, so you have to uh, work towards developing a methodology that continually uh, validates that trustworthiness. Uh, and finally, from a kind of a high-level summary perspective, uh, there's, there's different levels of criticality and risk here, the cost versus benefit. Uh, I, I think the, the uh, methodology here is that, you know, from a defense or, a, say, a nuclear or financial perspective, uh, the element of risk and, and what could happen is, is much more catastrophic than, say, certain uh, consumer-grade uh, products or solutions, right? So there's, there's a cost-benefit uh, proposition here that we, we need to take into consideration on, you know, how thorough we need to validate these solutions. So overall, the team uh, went through a brainstorming exercise in about an hour. Uh, we came up with uh, 21 recommendations. And uh, I'm just going to read off a few of the ones that are circled to the top. And, and these are also supportive of, of the work that we did last year uh, in Dallas on the same issue. Uh, but the, uh, the first one is develop a policy and a framework and outcomes for guidelines on how public and private partnerships can work this issue together, right? So come out with these guidelines. Uh, we believe this would be a, a good thing for the East-West Institute to continue working. Uh, help define a, a method and quantify the prioritized the threats and the risk. I think that goes back into the measurement system, right? So, so I think that's something we definitely need to understand is how do we actually measure this problem, right? So that we know that whatever we develop uh, and put in place is effective uh, going forward. Uh, focus on a risk management approach, uh, maybe perhaps in this back in the metrics, so a weighted threat metrics. I mean, again, we need, we need a methodology for uh, quantifying the risk. Um, certain things like enabling sharing of best practices and then enabling uh, transparency and a traceability type matrix. So, so those were some of the top findings. Uh, some of the others which were supportive is, is you know, kind of uh, put a process in place like an I, maybe an ISO 9000 type uh, process that, that uh, pursues and uh, helps validate supply chain integrity. And that's it. Thank you, Mark. As I was uh, going, uh, to the dictionary and looking at definitions of trust, I found one that I think really kind of summarized the work that we're all doing here. Um, and I'll, I'll read it to you quickly here. It was basically uh, one as reliance on something in the future, hope. And I, I think that really captures it all. And as you leave here today, I want you to think about that because this work is important. And uh, it's, it's really about the future, the future of the internet. And in, in some cases, the future of the work that we're doing in our countries. So with that, I thank you and have a great day. Ramses, thank you so much. Uh, Carl. Yeah, sure. Well, well, this is one of my favorite uh, things to say when we ever talk about trust is a quote from one of your, paper, your Harvard papers where you've said, uh, pa rough paraphrasing, you say something like, you know, we're basically um, using untrusted devices with untr untrusted applications for untrusted services, untrusted networks, untrusted supply chains. There's, there's an incredible um, challenge that we have to really do the due diligence here. And a number of these sessions dealt with that. I like the way Ramsey's framed it to include both the national level and also the the trust that needs to take place uh, across sectors. Uh, a few comments here in terms of progress. Um, if you observe what um, Ramsey said, um, he was really talking about a lot of implementation. Um, there is, um, for measuring the cybersecurity problem, there's a draft report that's fairly mature, and the, the kind of next steps that are in that are the things that he was talking about doing. So the, really the nature of that discussion has moved on from just a general brainstorming into some very practical things, how to move forward and implement it. One, one uh, note, a footnote here on this topic, it was that this was one that we had no expectation going into Dallas this would happen. It, it was organically derived from the dis breakthrough discussions uh, from uh, some Juniper and AT&T AT contributions. And so, you know, it's neat to see how we were able to uh, be flexible and accommodate that and, 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 and uh, be, have it carried on to this point as it did. Um, as far as the ICT supply chain, I think uh, Mark did a great job. And, and Mark, I appreciate your leadership not only here but also in the IEEE in this area. I think he, he outlined a number of uh, important areas for guidance. Um, a comment on the spam report. Um, obviously, we have very specific uh, actionable recommendations here. Um, maybe it was sounding pretty impressive last time that within a year the Reguchi's 
um, team was able to do things. We actually have a situation now immediately when this report is being delivered. We have the message anti-abuse working group, the MOG, leadership and attendance to here today committing to help uh, deliver uh, the implementation of those recommendations. They already supported meetings that Kamash perhaps could talk about in Delhi last month, and meetings are being planned now in Beijing and at, over dinner last night, uh, uh, early planning to, to do some uh, meetings in Moscow. So we're directly correlated to the, to the meetings, um, to the recommendations in this area. So um, I think that's very encouraging in terms of the progress that we could see being made here. Kamash. Uh, under trust, actually, a very wide range of topics have been covered, so I don't know really how to summarize it. But if you, if I have the opportunity of looking at all the three uh, separately, the first one, the measuring the cybersecurity problem, it's a, it's a real challenge, uh, essentially because uh, the number of records compromised and uh, the, for example, even the value of information uh, uh, or the financial losses they are identified by a number of sites. But then completeness is a big issue. Something like uh, DB loss, there's a site, privacyclearinghouse.org. So there are multiple such uh, places where one can go to and identify sector-wise also the kind of uh, uh, losses uh, which have taken place. Now, what uh, this group is trying to build on is the uh, trusted entity and then the company is giving voluntarily information to them. So the key questions are, uh, why would companies uh, part with data voluntarily? Because obviously uh, the companies are not doing so. That is why there's a need for coming up with uh, breach notification laws around the world. Many of the states in the US have done it and uh, Europe is trying to do it also. So the key question remains on what are the values? And I have participated in one of the groups and I've found that the expectations were very, very different. Uh, some of the people expected that if they contribute uh, on the type of data which uh, Rams has referred to, that they'll be sharing with them. And then uh, probably the inputs which will come back in terms of numbers and so on will help them improve the security even further. So there, there's, a, there's a slight, uh, uh, I would say, expectations which are, uh, which are different. So uh, the, the focus uh, has to remain on the uh, the nature of uh, data that the companies will share and uh, the kind of benefits they certainly would expect, only then they'll be sharing data. And the trusted entity, if it becomes a repository, whether on a global basis or on a regional basis, that the data they'll be sitting on, uh, they have to be very trustworthy in terms of practices that they implement. They should not be subject to breach tomorrow, something which was the uh, debate around uh, key escrow once upon a time. So this entity will have to be very, very responsive and very responsible in terms of implementation of uh, many of these things. Uh, but then uh, the benefits which the companies will get uh, will have to be quantified uh, more in detail. And I'm talking more about this is, uh, because I was uh, partially in one of the groups. Uh, now secondly, on the uh, spam report, uh, we again went through partly in one of the uh, working groups. But I have a specific question which I wanted answered to. Uh, yesterday, the ambassador made, the Chinese ambassador made uh, a comment that spam in China has come down over the last uh, few years, consistently has been going down. I just wanted to understand uh, what is it a result of? Is it a result of some of the practices being followed? Or is it uh, a result of uh, uh, some of the sites being taken out by by law, by enforcement, by, by whatever methods. I have a specific question on spam with respect to China. I don't know who will respond to this. Perhaps you are. You are Jason. You want? Yeah. Oh, Jason? Or Richard? Yeah, there's, Richard. A, there's a Richard Zhao, Zhao and uh, Yuan. <clears throat> well, otherwise we'll move on. Okay. Yeah. On the... Uh, I think we should move on. Can okay. We? Now to the third part on the ICT uh, supply chain. Uh, some of the recommendations are good. Uh, my specific question is on the traceability. The best practices, of course, uh, very, very good. They have to be implemented. And uh, prioritization of risk also has to be there. But on traceability, how much would you link it with the trusted identities? Is uh, is trusted identities uh, essential to identifying persons who are creating uh, uh, 
uh, difficulties are creating uh, all kinds of uh, uh, attacks and so on. Just briefly touched on that, but I, I believe that's something as we, we also agreed we need to take those ideas and we would continue to flush them out and uh, get more clarity on, on the actions But uh, going forward, but th that's certainly something we need to consider. I think I'm done. Thank you, Kamlesh. John. Uh, Renzi's, uh, John, Jason, Mark, thank you very much um, for covering, again, somewhat of a significant amount of detail in a short period of time. With regards to the data, the, the, the two pieces I took away from it thematically were the shift of conversation from data to information to action, essentially the life cycle of how that would work, uh, such that the, the, the what, the what model, the org, and then how the org should look like essentially turned into actionable data was one of the points you made. And I think that's, that's probably the most important thing to remember is if you're going to be doing it, what are you going to do with it as a result of having it as opposed to just collecting? Collecting seems to be almost the easiest part. Uh, coordinating and consolidating and making actionable seems to be the hardest. Uh, I was encouraged to hear the discussion around not reinventing the wheels using actuarial models uh, with the potential of using something in an adjacent field uh, that would, uh, would help the data collection um, be uh, somewhat better defined. Um, and then the uh, innovative idea that I heard out of it was what I would have considered, and I think, Ramsey, you mentioned this to, a, uh, to me earlier, uh, the potential of actually having the data have uh, a collection system that's self-correcting through normalization curving, uh, such for all intents and purposes having crowdsourcing determine if something's good and something's bad. Uh, on the spam side, um, only one comment, uh, which was uh, the irony of, uh, and I think Jason said it, uh, communication needs to continue and be coordinated since everybody else is doing it, potentially not except the people that are trying to stop spam. And my comment to the, org, uh, to the people working on this one is, this may be one of those classic examples of EWI trying to figure out how to help a radical idea. We are in our 20th plus year of spam existing, um, and we haven't systemically solved it. So the learnings potentially from China, um, the learnings of how to do something very radically different would be my, my request to that group. Uh, with regards to supply chain, a topic very near and dear to my heart, um, uh, most assuredly global issue, uh, the life cycle issue. Uh, I like the transparency and traceability piece of the discussion uh, since I, my sense is that that's precisely what the, the hardest part but yet the most uh, important part of it is. Um, and my hope is that that, uh, that team as its work uh, continues uh, ensures to uh, work with organizations that are blossoming almost on a daily basis uh, around supply chain fear, worry, concern, et cetera, uh, with, a, with a sort of a final plug on that topic, uh, which is Scott Charney's talk at lunch uh, should be interesting in that respect. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Um, I, I think that as I uh, listened to the conversation and, and building upon the previous panel, uh, we talked to, and, and Jason talked to, the 24 by 7, seven uptime um, of the Internet service providers and how dependent we are on the communications and that we need something very similar of 24 by 7 uptime on keeping the communications channels open in order to build the trust and to build those relationships um, going forward. And that it's not just from individual to individual, but it's individual to institution and then the institution to the government and that it, it ranges the gambit of local to global in order to get to that um, communication and trust building. Um, that the process needs to be without an agenda. That it can't be uh, of influence by the government or by a collective group that is seeing, seeing it uh, to move their own particular agenda or item forward and the process whether as we manage the risk and we look at the metrics we need to keep in mind that each of our uh, uh, institutions and or governments are taking a different approach to breach law to privacy law uh, and um, and how we think about uh, culturally from our, our different um, uh, 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 geographies and countries um, we need to shift from the data to the actionable data. 
Uh, and as we go forward, I think that, um, and you think about the periodicity of the different things that are happening in this particular area from, and just the news of the day, you know, whether it's the Epsilon breach that's, we're losing our, our personal information and our credit cards, or the RSA breach that we're losing our authentication mechanisms, which is taking and basically questioning our trust in the system, the Sony breach, and albeit it uh, very costly to Sony, actually it showed that our children were vulnerable um, and it affected a whole different population that has not been affected really previously in any of the other data breaches. Our governments, our defense contractors, and through all of these different things, the risk model is going up and it's going up in different ways, whether it's a personal risk, it's a risk to my family, it's a risk to my institution, it's a risk to my government, um, and how do we actually measure that along the way? So if you think about the trust is equal to frequency and the frequency of meetings and keeping those communications open, I, I close with this quote of, um, uh, and it takes your two, uh, uh, Ramsey's, it takes your two quotes and pulls them into one or your two definitions. It's uh, built upon integrity so we can rely on our future. And we need to figure out how we build the integrity into the system and increase the frequency of communications so that our future um, is, is a brighter one. I am going to now move on to uh, Jib Godwin is going to talk about rules of the road. And um, rules of the road is uh, certainly prominent in every major newspaper around the world uh, given the release of uh, the international strategy in the United States and the conversations here from uh, Defense Minister Harvey and from the Department of Defense in the United States about cyber weapons, cyber proliferation, and cyber war. And so uh, I think Rules of the Road is going to be a very um, fruitful and necessary conversation as we go forward. Jib? I agree with you. Uh, before I do anything else, John, uh, I thank you for uh, a couple of things, but one of the keys uh, is this opportunity for this conference. But number two, for the strate strategic move that you made in getting Carl Rauscher on the EWI team full time instead of just being a part time player. Uh, because I think uh, as I talk to uh, our members out here, I say, all right, so how did you know Carl? Uh, it's no longer a question. Uh, it's a fact of uh, how he's helped to knit together uh, what's going on here. So not that there aren't other EWI Institute uh, folks that are doing great things, but Carl's been at the root of a lot of these things recently. So good to know you're paying him full time. <clears throat> Uh, Melissa, uh, I take uh, a turn here for just a second and say Simon Cowell is back home uh, and last night for the first time I watched Britain's Got Talent, uh, I think that's the name of the show or something like that, and I noticed David Hasselhoff is part of that team. So uh, <clears throat> the reason I bring that up is because I believe that American Idol is really about singing, you know, and not about the other performances and Britain's Got Talent's got all the other things in it. So I think there's, uh, it was an interesting show last night, and it was uh, close to the finals. Uh, the interesting thing for me, as well as uh, the opportunity to build relationships here, I've met people before, I've seen people, you haven't seen them for a year, and have the opportunity to get back here and, and see them again, and you can, like old home week when you come back again, but also to make new uh, friendships and new relationships uh, and see things uh, that uh, really start to move out. The comment about Think and Do Tank uh, that uh, Carl raised, the good news is I believe in the themes that we've heard here through the other two speakers and through the comments that are out here and at the panel at the front. Dallas was a seminal event. Uh, and so now out of Dallas, we got a lot of actions, Raguchi and all that stuff with the undersea cables was already ongoing and had been going before that. But now some of these others got started. Well, these that we're gonna talk about here uh, in the uh, rules of the road, uh, I would have called them rules of engagement uh, because of my military career, but uh, I think they're all there. But they're derivatives, uh, all five of these categories are derivatives off of what we learned uh, coming out of Dallas. Because I got to be part of that uh, with a crowd of lawyers at my table uh, in Dallas when we were going about that. Uh, I would also say that I've had the opportunity to be part of the bilateral uh, conversations uh, on three different uh, efforts, uh, and so that's been really uh, interesting as well. Uh, but to see us drive uh, home and get some validation out of what we have been doing for the last year plus uh, on both the spam issue uh, as well as uh, what we've uh, done with uh, 
and a cyber taxonomy uh, and, and terminology that, that, that we need to, uh, to do. What I'd like to do for a second, so this is for the staff. I'm going to call out uh, the categories of the uh, five uh, committees that uh, we're meeting uh, and the names of the people so that you can see where they are so we can save time. I'm a type A personality, so I apologize. Uh, we don't need to waste time walking around. So Bob Campbell, uh, I think, is right up here in front. Uh, he's going to do assessing the engagement of uh, protected entities in cyberspace. We don't have to do him yet. So, Bob, rules of the road, uh, cyber babble, building a uh, cybersecurity glossary and taxonomy. Uh, I think there was uh, several of us here, but uh, I was uh, the spokesman since I was at the podium. I figured I'd just stay here and do that. Uh, Joe Nye is going to talk about uh, where we are with new non-state actor power in cyberspace. Uh, Stuart Goldman, you'll see uh, through a whole bunch of things. I was in part of his uh, session this morning, and I think he got de facto declared as uh, a co-chairman, uh, even though he was a uh, champion uh, during that session. He'll do markers in cyberspace. And then Phyllis Schneck is uh, right over here, uh, and Phyllis will do uh, norms of behavior in cyber conflict. And I sat in on that one, too, and I would tell you uh, there's no lack for passion uh, in what we did in our conversation in our committee, nor in that one either. Uh, and they didn't spend time on conflict. They spent a lot of time talking about war or, or cyber warfare or why not uh, call it cyber warfare. So, and maybe she'll characterize that uh, just a, a little bit different. <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, thank everybody for uh, the work that they did. And so I will talk uh, for just a second about where we are with uh, building cybersecurity uh, glossary and uh, taxonomy. This came out of our bilateral discussions with the Russians uh, and was uh, really about uh, how we could take uh, terms of agreement between us uh, and negotiate out uh, 20 uh, terms between us. There's many more than that that uh, were uh, identified. Uh, we identified 20 key ones. Uh, I think uh, the, the real good news of this is we've got a path forward uh, in showing how we're going to tackle the next 20 uh, and then how we move on to uh, the next 20 beyond that. Uh, and I think we intend to go to uh, Delhi uh, with uh, 60 in our pocket. Uh, so a lot of work to do, and it's no longer going to be in a bilateral relationship, but in a multilateral relationship so that uh, we, can keep, uh, we can keep moving. There was some positive reinforcement that occurred, uh, and that was uh, that we had the opportunity to uh, get feedback that uh, they were, the, the terms that we had were clear and concise uh, and that uh, there, was, uh, there was good continuity that was in those. There were some interesting tensions. Justice Tandon was uh, part of our uh, uh, committee as well. Uh, and he uh, talked about uh, where are we between civil and criminal jurisdictions uh, and how retribution is paid out to uh, victims uh, in this uh, domain as well. <clears throat> there was some boundary discussions. Uh, where does cyber, uh, cyberspace end and cyber infrastructure begin? Uh, that's uh, kind of a nebulous uh, uh, thing that I think we have to wrestle with. Uh, and the real question was that I think one of our colleagues brought up was, if you have a standalone computer that's sitting on a desktop that's not hooked up to the network, is that part of cyber infrastructure or not? A cyber attack could still be affected on that device uh, because somebody could walk in and stick a, a, a memory stick into it and infect it uh, and create a situation uh, on that uh, device. <clears throat> I believe the uh, committee felt as though uh, we focused uh, militaristically uh, on uh, where we were with cyber war uh, and that one of the things that we did, and this led to uh, the conversations in this uh, committee over here today as well, that uh, we focused so much on state to state uh, that uh, the thing that we needed to brush up on a little bit was how we handle uh, non-state actors. Uh, and so there's work that needs to be done there. Uh, and there's some clarification uh, around, you know, either doing one of two things, keeping war, cyber war, where it is with defined boundaries that are around it, uh, and then redefine uh, or loosen up or tighten up the conversation uh, on what cyber conflict is. Uh, and so that's work I know that was directly applicable to uh, where y'all were. And so some great collaboration across uh, where, we, uh, where we go with that next. Um, the, the real good thing, though, was uh, I believe we had four people uh, out of the session after we finished up on our action items and closed up on those that committed to, after we take these issues back to 
uh, Carl uh, as uh, our lead for what we're doing in the bilateral negotiations, that uh, he would, uh, we would have conversations with them on the phone to, if there was clarification needed on our part. So with that, Bob, over to you. Thank you. The uh, objective of our work group was to focus on the policy implications of the entanglement of protected entities uh, in cyberspace, critical health care services, critical human services, other services critical to uh, human life. Uh, I had had the good fortune of being at the seminal session in Beijing with John two years ago where the issue was first identified. It certainly was a high priority issue in Dallas last year where uh, the potential application of Geneva Convention provisions was recognized and acknowledged. Uh, this has also been a high priority subject for the Institute in the period since Dallas leading to bilateral U.S.-Russia dialogue on the topic and the report that was recently released on that front, uh, which I would certainly commend to you. The five recommendations in this report really represented the foundation for the discussion of our work group yesterday and I believe it's fair to say with a couple of exce exceptions substantially confirmed the major recommendations and broader applicability of those recommendations coming out of the U.S.-Russia dialogue. Uh, we did have a very robust discussion. Certainly the discussion, among other things, confirmed the need for more development work between now and India on this very complex topic. Let me highlight just several of the key uh, observations coming out of yesterday's session. Uh, first of all, I believe there was an agreement that there is a need to define much more specifically those human services on the Internet which should be subject to the policy, policy set. We continue to use healthcare examples, but there's certainly a broad number of services affecting people's lives now out on the Internet and think developing a clear taxonomy of those services is in order. I think secondly, in yesterday's discussion, uh, there was an acknowledgement uh, of the need to think through the policy implications of threats to broader infrastructure such as the electric grid, which although arguably not a critical human services as healthcare, would be still can have a material impact on the availability of uh, health and human services for those in need. Uh, we. I believe substantially agreed that the policy set developed, although developed contemplating cyber war sort of scenarios, should be e equally applic applicable in peacetime, so it wasn't just wartime scenario. I think along those lines, as we discuss the U.S.-Russia recommendation, uh, out of that dialogue concerning markers in cyberspace for protected entities. There was some concern around the table around the uh, potential risk of identifying markers if we also contemplate non-state actors and motivation of non-state actors. So that would be one area that we think requires a little bit more thinking coming out of uh, uh, yesterday's discussion. Uh, we. Uh, discussed that uh, more work needs to be done to explore potentially unbundling certain services uh, uh, from this entanglement subject to cost-benefit analysis, uh, also recommending that uh, more work be done around potential backup capabilities and multilateral lateral backup support uh, relative to critical uh, health and human services would also be warranted. I believe that summarizes the major findings coming out of our discussion. Thanks, Bob. Joe. Thank you. Uh, I mentioned last night as I was introducing uh, General Radegui that in my new book on the future of power, I identified diffusion of power as one of the great power shifts of this century. And that essentially means the empowerment of non-state actors by information technology, and particularly in cyber. You can see this with the extraordinary low barriers to entry 
now anybody can get into actions which previously were reserved to large entities or to states. And the other is uh, basically the problems of attribution. Uh, with poor attribution, uh, you can have extraordinary opportunities for non-state actors to do damage without knowing quite where it came from. Uh, this can range from everything from the extraordinary range of issues that were talked about yesterday, including cyber crime at large scale, but also dangers of false flags, which can cause trouble among states. But what's interesting about this is that when you have non-state actors, uh, sometimes they can create common interests among states because they can get states in to situations over their heads or into conflicts that the states themselves don't want. So as our group discussed non-state actors, uh, there were basically two ideas that I thought were particularly interesting as potential responses. One was to bring the state back in, and the other I'll call to use a thief to catch a thief. First, uh, use, bring the state back in. There is a rule in international law that a state is responsible for attacks that go through its sovereign territory. Uh, what that means is that if a attack occurs, uh, you can require that the state, which was the source of the location of the last server identified, owes you an obligation of information and forensic assistance. This doesn't solve the problem, but at least it buys time and increases communication. So you can have a rule of the road, essentially, that can do some good there. The other idea, which was this idea of use a thief to catch a thief, is to use non-state actors against non-state actors, essentially by using the soft power of naming and shaming. So if you think about non-responsive actors, uh, but in which you can't get attribution that's good enough for a court of law, but you can get attribution that's good enough for CNN, then non-state actors, the WikiLeaks and others of this world, can essentially be part of a solution. Now, neither of these two ideas that we discussed in greater length than I have time for today uh, solve any large problems of non-state actors, but they do indicate that you can develop some rules of the road and devices which can at least buy time, increase cooperation among states in the areas where they have common interests and limit some of the damages that non-state actors do. So, so I'm going to uh, take liberty. Uh, Stuart's next. Uh, we got about two minutes each for you guys, uh, Stuart and Phyllis, uh, and we're already on the red light, but I'm going to use uh, what uh, I was given as latitude by our uh, distinguished chair. Okay, thank you. I will talk as quickly as I can. But I do want to first acknowledge uh, Jason Healy, who took our minutes and was originally going to give this uh, output. So I am deeply indebted to him, and I apologize if I'm stepping on a toe. Uh, we started to discuss the, the uh, distinctive emblems in cyberspace, which is really a very simple carryover from the Geneva Convention, where you have a red cross painted on the top of an ambulance, and you're not supposed to attack the ambulance. So the discussion is, if you take that that concept and bring it into cyberspace, what does it mean? Uh, we spent lots of time trying to define who the actors were, whether or not the existing uh, dot extensions like EDU uh, and so on was sufficient or if we needed a new distinctive emblem. We decided that the logical approach to this is before discussing the details of the emblem, whether it be an IPv6, whether it be a, a new extension, whether it be another flag, whether it be a dedicated IP range of addresses, that we first needed to understand the policy of how this protective space would work, what rules would apply, what uh, sanctions would apply, what constituted a violation. If you're going to a hospital and just looking at patient records, does that, is that an attack? Are you, does it have to be more physical? If you're going through a server to attack a third party, is, does that count? So we really needed to understand the policies that surrounded this before we could discuss the protocol and the implementations that would be sufficient to meet that policy. What we agreed to 
is, and you'll, you'll like this, we circulated a piece of paper and unanimously everyone in the room gave us a name and an email address and we have formed a virtual group to work on this. So our next steps are going to be a virtual committee to work on the policy aspects of this so that we can then go into the more technical side of it, which is usually the easiest side, which is the implementation. Was that succinct enough? Thank you. Phyllis? Son? So first of all, good morning. I'll be very brief. I just want to thank uh, EWI and Carl and uh, certainly the committee for a very productive and, and lively, passionate discussion. And uh, very special thanks to my co-chair, Professor Mingji. Um, so overall, we looked at this concept of cyber war, cyber conflict, um, and overall we, we realized we're all connected. Catastrophic harm to one part of the world is catastrophic harm to all of us. Uh, the network changed the game 25 years ago and that it connects all of us in what we do. Um, so key things that came out, terminology. We need a way to look at cyber conflict, information warfare, cyber warfare, cyber war. What is it? How do we define it? And looking at making a recommendation to globally uh, form some coalescence around those key concepts as we pursue this further. Um, understanding that it would take uh, a lot to build a large glossary of thousands of terms, but create a living way to, protect, to portray these concepts that we have to consider. Uh, we need a mapping of common viewpoints. So looking across the different commonalities, looking at the keynote yesterday where it was mentioned the spectrum, from soft events to hard events, paraphrasing a little, but we talked a lot about that in our session, looking at how we can actually form commonalities on what, where the harm really is at that very hard end, even if we can't all agree in every nation what the soft events are within our policies, those hard catastrophic ones, the destruction, that's the one we need to prevent. Looking at concepts such as the logic bomb, at what point does one malicious instruction or several become an actual act of hostility when it's planted, where it's planted? Uh, can you look at uh, the need for obligatory forensics across the world and certainly the need for attribution before we do that? So making a recommendation to explore those issues, um, certainly again as they pursue those very hard events going forward. And finally looking at, to leverage a lot of pre-existing work, pre-existing relationships, work that's been done across different nations, specifically calling out CJK or the China-Japan-Korean alliance that was brought to our attention this morning, where there are hotlines and response and different ways that they all respond and collaborate each and every day. And, and to mention something that's been raised a lot for the past 36 hours, it gets back to that human trust and human uh, collaboration. So thank you very much. Thanks, Phyllis. Madam Chairman, we're ready for your cross-examination. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Uh, with everybody's indulgence, we're going to probably go over for at least five minutes. Um, and uh, so, Carl, please, if you could start. Yeah, I'm actually going to try to keep my comments less than a minute here. I think you just heard a, an excellent um, articulation of very specific uh, implementation steps that are being taken from each of these. And I refer you to the, the two publications we have, the one on uh, uh, terminology and the one on rendering the Geneva and Hague Conventions in cyberspace to, and look at the next steps. And you just heard an you know, excellent articulation of that. And again, I'll defer time because I know we have one more group we're, we're trying to call on after this. Yeah. yeah, I'll also take about a minute only. Uh, I think what has been talked about is in terms of uh, clear definitions that uh, countries should agree mm -hmm. upon. And uh, then uh, attribution is a key issue. Attribution and uh, trusted identity, which I talked about in the previous uh, part also. Uh, these are some things which are very, very important. And the role of non-state actors, uh, that can also be brought to book or to justice only if attribution or uh, rather trusted identity part is uh, clearly there. So we have to look at our recommendations in the form of uh, trying to identify the persons, although anonymity and uh, growth of internet and uh, democracy like the Arab Springs that we have been uh, seeing uh, recently, that is something which also we would like to promote uh, under the internet. So these are, uh, these are things which have to be reconciled and uh, the solutions are very, very difficult. So I don't think I'll go beyond this to make any comments here. Oh, thank you. John. Uh, Jim, Bob, Joe, Stuart, Phyllis, thank you uh, for the uh, comprehensive discussion around, frankly, what seemed to be all the way from beginning to end, a discussion about language um, and Phyllis's last comment from the, uh, Jim's first comment. The, the pieces I took away, um, first of all, the, the, 
Disentanglement uh, major recommendation continued to sustain itself from Beijing all the way to now. Um, that there was a serious need to discuss where human services, including the supporting infrastructure beneath them, are highly identified so that those soft targets don't, in fact, become the subjects of uh, up to and including hostile action. Um, I appreciate Joe's comment about uh, threshold and, and non attribution and that. You know, the potential could be if we just took that which we know and painted the picture, irrespective of the fact that it might be somebody else behind the machine that you know, at least you could get data you can rely upon and then allow for the system to start correcting to what is the true actor. Um, the, uh, I'm always uh, willing to call out continued work, and Stuart, you're mentioning uh, some the virtual group continuing. Um, and then Phyllis's comments, and I think it's, it, it renders itself very, very important for the future. What is hostile and when does it actually cross that threshold so that we can determine appropriate reaction? Thank you. Thank you, John. I'm going to go back to Jib's first comment of um, it's not really American Idol, it's Britain's Got Talent. And um, I can say that having spent a good portion of my life learning the English language, I'm still learning it. And speaking some other foreign languages, to me at least, uh, for the last 20 some odd years, I'm still learning those too. So it's no surprise that we need the Rosetta Stone for cybersecurity and, and beginning with 20 terms to get to a million terms, we have a, a long way to go and perhaps we can, we can insert some technology along the way to make it a little easier. Um, and uh, so with that, I, I think that uh, the, from ranging from the tactics and techniques from the lowest barrier of entry that we need to continue to establish that learning environment. And Misha Glenny said it yesterday in his speech, and I think it was really reiterated by Joe, you know, the one for one, use a thief to catch a thief, or is it use the hacker to learn from the hacker so we can anticipate the next tactics, techniques, and procedures so that we're not fooled by the false flag and that we can actually begin the dialogue for moving forward and the rules of engagement and getting to a common dialogue. Um, I have asked the panel to do an overall summary, but uh, it was made uh, uh, two points that I'd like to raise. Um, as we're all up here talking, uh, there was another breakout group that talked to um, youth, um, and uh, I just want, my good friend Deborah Tate is gonna be leading an entire panel on youth protection and digital citizenship this afternoon, so we're not gonna be hearing from those breakthrough groups, and that will be summarized by Deborah uh, later um, on. And I'd like to, um, if Angela McKay is here, still in the audience, um, there was, Another breakthrough group that was discussed as part of um, uh, health and the IT model, and perhaps that could be a uh, mechanism by which we can learn from. So if we can hear from Angela, who's here in the third row, and she's getting ready to get that. If you could spend a couple of minutes talking to us about what we learned. I'm sorry, it's not gonna be Angela, it's gonna be Lewis. Thanks. Uh, uh, Jeff Jones, <coughs> Jeff. a colleague of Angela. I'm a spokesperson for the group, so. Uh, yeah, this was a, a new breakthrough group, and uh, it was uh, <clears throat> collective action to improve global internet health. Uh, lucky to have two great co-chairs, uh, Scott Charney of Microsoft, uh, as well as Brian Littlefair of uh, Vodafone, and uh, <clears throat> 30 subject matter experts across uh, government, industry, and academia. So uh, with it being a new group, um, the co-chairs kicked us off and talked a little bit about complicated problems versus complex problems. And uh, I really charged the group with um, decomposing this complicated problem uh, into, into elements that we could move forward and make independent progress on. So um, we spent the first session uh, really working on a, a simplified problem statement, which uh, there was a lot of, lot of, di lot of discussion around, but uh, really, you know, I think centered around uh, that there's no current global coordinated approach to protecting people from, uh, from malware and uh, related threats. Uh, <clears throat> and with that as, as the problem statement, we spent most of the first session uh, looking at the public health model as a metaphor uh, for, for uh, looking at addressing that problem, uh, discussing uh, its applicability. Um, there were some there were some interesting things to come out of that. Uh, I think 
in general, there was a consensus that it was a useful metaphor. Uh, and uh, several things were identified that, you know, where, where it broke down. Uh, and a recognition within the group that it, it could be a, a useful model for, for making progress, uh, but whether it, it broke down that the group just needed to recognize that it broke down and look, look for other ways to, to make progress forward on that. So um, let's see. Uh, a lot of discussion about different levels of, of where it applied, so health of the ecosystem overall. Uh, and also that you could drill into certain areas. For example, there was a good discussion about previous work that had been done around health of DNS or uh, the, the security of DNS, and that there's uh, key, key indicators of, of health around something uh, as small or, and narrow as that DNS, but at the same time you could go up and look at the global, uh, the global level and you need to develop uh, indicators that, that might uh, indicate health of systems. Uh, Related to that, uh, there was some discussion and acknowledgement that uh, like, uh, like the area of public health, uh, the idea of ach achieving a fully healthy system uh, was, was not going to be achievable, but one of the recognitions is that if you had a system uh, that, that worked together in, in a way similar to the public health model, uh, that you've always got a state of unhealth uh, so it would be working on identify those areas and having well-known, trusted mechanisms that, that people or organizations or uh, uh, whatever level of granularity are knew uh, the steps that they, they could take to get back to, to business as normal. Um, let's see. There were several, several areas that were discussed in terms of just identifying uh, where there were, there were big differences. Uh, such as speed of progression. I think one of the interesting things that came out of that was a recognition that uh, in the world of cyber, um, malware is driven by uh, human actors, right? This is a big difference from, from something where uh, in the physical world, uh, you've got diseases or illness uh, that may fight adversarially from a survival viewpoint. Uh, but in the cyber world, what we're dealing with is humans and intelligence who, who, who are driving uh, some of the changes going forward. Uh, that indicates that there's some things you can do around uh, disincenting some of it that, that wouldn't necessarily uh, work in the public health model. Uh, good discussions <laughs> around perspective and viewpoint, uh, that depending on what viewpoint you were looking at, you know, uh, in terms of a global level or perhaps a regional level or down at uh, individual uh, models that that the indicators that you would look at for health of the system or, or security of the system uh, could be quite different. Uh, in the second session, I'd say um, there was a lot of discussion on uh, sharing uh, existing efforts that are out there. Uh, uh, specific ones uh, were, were shared with, with some of the participants from some, some of the, uh, the telco participants. Uh, there was also discussion of the German anti-botnet effort uh, as well as the, the French anti-spam effort. The, the, there's a, the Japanese, anti, uh, some of the anti-botnet efforts. Uh, and talk about how lessons could be learned uh, f from some of these efforts and applied more globally and at scale. Uh, and some, some, of the, some of the lessons uh, sh shared by the group were just that uh, s some of the things they were doing couldn't scale and so there had to be other, other uh, other things done. Uh, and also in that second session, a lot of discussion on metrics, metrics and measurement, and that it would be important to, to identify that a, as a system of, of measuring progress and going forward. So uh, let me just kind of conclude that, uh, as this is a new group, um, there, there is intention for the group to continue meeting after this, uh, to continue the decomposition uh, we did talk about decomposition in a couple different ways. One is a little bit of discussion that, uh, that to make progress on this, uh, that there has to be progress made in areas such as uh, social, so social acceptance for any solutions that had to be made, as well as other areas like legal enablement across uh, different regions around the globe uh, that might, might need to happen in order for technical solutions to be feasible. And then within the technical area, uh, a lot of a lot of different things. Uh, it was it was great to hear that some of the groups, uh, some of the people representing uh, uh, groups, already had pilots 
uh, that could be said to have fallen in this area, so there were some lessons already being uh, learned. So the group intends to continu continue meeting periodically. We haven't determined exactly what that period will be, but with the intention that uh, hopefully end of summer uh, a first report will come out with the group with some uh, initial recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're all now going to uh, summarize the themes that we heard from um, the, all of the collective groups. Jeff, thanks so much for giving us the output on that, and we're sorry that it was overlooked. Um, Carl. Yeah, John often talk, talks about this institution doesn't just describe a ball, but it moves the ball down the field. I think you just saw examples that we together um, are moving balls down the field. We've talked about them, but we're actually seeing a number of balls moving down the field in the right direction. The other thing I'd point out is that we've also seen um, uh, significant collaboration between the East and the West. Significant material, you could touch it, physical, tangible uh, uh, guidance and recommendations here in collaboration with Russia and the United States, China and the United States, and India stepping forward to do uh, tremendous things in terms of leadership. Uh, going back to my earlier points, I think that the commitment and the, and, the, and the vision we're having here for international party communications is uh, really needs to be underscored. Um, I often meet with people and they tell me, you know, Carl, you know, we'd like to, ha we'd like to be associated with, with thought leadership. And, uh, and then they'll, they'll talk about, well, we, we saw this in the news or, or we, heard, we read about this recently. Uh, people have a comfort zone of kind of reacting to things that are out there. There hasn't been a major crisis yet that people have talked about in the news, even though it is happening. Lives are lost and property uh, is being lost. We're doing something proactively about something that really hasn't been effectively reported on in the media. That is true examples of thought leadership and the commitments we're seeing from an officer of uh, a company to step forward very aggressively and look at this, that's, that's do leadership. Not only thought leadership, but do leadership. And someone made a comment, we need to take uh, this to the people in power. There are people in this room that are decision makers. Another conversation over dinner last night with someone who's on the board of a major, another equipment supplier was saying the same thing. Hey, we need to look at this. So um, I just make the, make the point that we have um, a lot of very encouraging things going on here in the uh, area of making progress. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Yeah. Uh, yesterday's Financial Times carried news that the uh, U.S. government, U.K. government, uh, wishes to raise an army of cyber soldiers. Uh, that is uh, to protect their uh, military infrastructure because the uh, infrastructure is being scanned more and more. So I think what I'd like to see is that we create a group, a working group, uh, under the ages of East West Institute and this uh, process that which talks about cyber espionage and cyber conflict uh, in a big way, discusses the issues of attribution and uh, anonymity, and both for the business uh, standpoint as well as uh, from the viewpoint of the governments and uh, cyber security. Because cyber security is now intertwined with the national security and you can't divorce it from this. So I think given that I was given only a minute, this is the point I would like to emphasize and. Uh, uh, give it to Melissa. Thank you, John. So I took uh, two uh, or three, and I'm going to make it three themes uh, from uh, consistently across all the working groups. And, and essentially, the three themes that I took away from it were uh, number one was trust. Uh, there was an interest in trusted communications, trusted cable infrastructure, that the data need to be trusted, that the systems from a supply chain perspective need to be trusted. We need to have trusted language so that we know that we're speaking to one another in, in, in the same way and same definitions and then we need to have trusted steps and actions on what to do. The second theme I took away from this was speed. Uh, it started off with sort of the access to priority communications and the speed by which it's needed. The speed of cable restoration and the requirements necessary there. The speed of taking data all the way to information and through into actionable steps. The speed of norms uh, so that there are global uh, supply chain understanding and, and norms and behaviors. Speed of definitions in language, including augmentation of them when they're necessary, and then speed, uh, speed of global response. My third theme is what I would call the clarity and consistency. Um, clarity came in the first session about clarity of communications and priority and need. Uh, clear and consistent cable processes, including the best in class and how they can be used, that we have to have clear data, that the, the data itself can be seen and then coordinated, clear definitions, clear language, clear lines to know when they are actually crossed and an act of aggression occurs, and a clear and consistent way for a global uh, coordination for the body of health. So those would be my three themes across all of them would be trust, speed, and clarity with consistency. Thank you again, Melissa. Thank you, John. I'm not sure I could top that. 
Um, thank you uh, for everybody for their participation. I'm going to just summarize with a few uh, statistics that I collected through um, this. Uh, in the first panel, we had 17 governments in Asia Pacific working together to close the gap from six months to five days to 24 hours. We had a partnership between the ICPC and the FS Financial Services Sector, Sector Coordination Committee, uh, the few to get to the collective and collective action of the many. Uh, we uh, had 46 best practices shared between two nations to reduce spam. <clears throat> we had 21 re recommendations built to build trust and increase transparency in the supply chain. We had 20 terms that were defined to get to uh, 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 a partnership among two nations. We had one for one, use a thief to catch a thief uh, and recruit one to learn from one. And I think among all of those, uh, we found that the technology is available. It's not the impediment. It's really that we need to move from local to global action and collect the data and the issues, coordinate our processes and policies, consolidate our recommendations to promote collective action. And it's been my honor to sit up here and help uh, moderate this panel. And thank you to all of the breakthrough groups for all of the hard work that you did over the last two days and last several months. Thank you.